When a young patriot gives his life for the cause of liberty, nearly all of Boston is in mourning. The Granary Burying Ground will become the final resting place of many founding fathers. But before them comes 11-year-old Christopher Sider. Samuel Adams made this into a huge public spectacle, and there was a great deal of anger in Boston. They stage an incredibly elaborate funeral with a bedecked coffin that gains mourners as it passes through town. While heartbroken by the death of a young boy at the hands of a British loyalist, Sam Adams also sees an opportunity to harness the tragedy. He uses the funeral as a rallying cry, a plea for all Americans to fight for individual rights that we hold so dear today. I'd like to present Boston's most renowned poet, who is like our victim, but a child herself. Just four years older than Christopher Sider, Phyllis Wheatley is a young poet with a future, on her way to becoming the first published African American. She memorializes the moment, turning a victim into a patriot. In heaven's eternal court it was decreed how the first martyr for the cause should bleed to clear the country of the hated brood. He wrecked his courage for the common good. All are endangered to the shafts of death. The generous sires beheld the fatal blow, saw their young champion gasping on the ground. Mine eyes have never seen such a funeral. This shows that there are many more lives to be spent if wanted in service to their country. This shows, too, that the faction is not yet expiring, and that the ardor of the people is not to be quelled by the slaughter of one child. It's in full view, this outpouring of sentiment over the loss of one individual who symbolizes the promise of what many people think should be an independent nation. The liberties of our country and the freedoms of our civil constitution must be defended at all hazards. They have been purchased at the expense of our treasure and our blood. They will be an everlasting mark of infamy if ever we shall suffer them being wrested from us by violence without a struggle. This we are in most danger of presently. Therefore, we must be aware of it. The funeral now has Boston looking to the Sons of Liberty for revenge. This boy's death becomes propaganda for Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty. And this is like a match to light the fuse that will explode into the American Revolution. In the days that follow Christopher Sider's funeral, tension in Boston reaches a climax. It's one of our Liberty boys. Someone get Dr. Warren! Please, somebody help me! What have they done? The death of Christopher Sider, it's confirmation of discontent with the presence of the British and an injustice coming from the parliament. So the people of Boston are feeling very angry. Hey, where's the money? You owe me master for a wig. First you take the job, then you cheat an honest man. An honest man? Where's this honest man you speak of? I don't see one before me now. Hey! Hey! The captain is an officer in His Majesty's army. He's a ruddy thief and a lobster scum. You know the type. The British want to demonstrate that we hold the power, and you guys better do what we tell you to do. With the town on edge, brigades of the British Army are never far away. Reinforcements arrive at a moment's notice. Captain Preston leads out the guard. They form around the front of the customs house. And at that point, the situation escalates, and a mob starts to grow. The more force the British bring to bear, the more radical the situation gets.
There was a build-up of tensions, of fear, and eventually it exploded. Remember, every detail of this misery. Every detail! We will all regret this day. Pushed to their limits by an oppressive empire, a determined group of rebels unites under the cause of liberty. Their quest for freedom will unify a people ignite a revolution, and forge a new system of government. In time, these brave men and women will come to be known as the American Patriots. John Adams, Boston's most influential founding father, a firebrand, an outspoken voice for human rights and the rule of law. But behind every voice stands a man, and behind every legend lies the truth. There is a misconception that the Patriots from Boston are a brotherhood of freedom fighters operating in lockstep. Two of our founding fathers, Sam and John Adams, actual members of the same family, find themselves at odds over the growing revolution. While Sam keeps the fervor of the rebellion boiling in the streets, John Adams isn't sure that defying the king, an act of treason punishable by death, is a good idea. Even after the Boston Massacre, John Adams needs more convincing before committing to revolution. Help me with this man! Good God, he'll start another riot with this. The Boston Massacre becomes a huge propaganda effort for Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty. You've got an immediately famous engraving by Paul Revere. It is one of the most inaccurate pieces of propaganda ever produced by an American press. Almost nothing in it is correct. This is treason! This is an early instance in the colonies of the power of what we now call media to shape the public opinion. You bloody liar! Well, Sam, will it do? Some of your finest work, I'd say. Samuel. You've replaced the Customs House with Butcher's Hall. What else have you changed? Look around you, cousin. The people demand justice. By the actions of an angry mob, Samuel, justice that is not. Those bastards killed five of our own. When are you going to get down off the fence and join the cause of your brethren? John Adams and Samuel Adams were not necessarily close. Sam Adams was a failed tax collector with a long history of debt. John Adams was a very principled man. He agreed in general people like Samuel Adams. But on the other hand, he was one who thought that things could get out of control. The rift between the Adams cousins is only made worse when John takes the case to defend the soldiers involved with the Boston Massacre. What is the matter, John? Representing the King's men in these times could put us all in grave danger. You promised Captain Preston and those men you'd take their case. There is no one in this colony or any other more suited to preserve justice than you, John. Either you believe in the principles you say you do or you do not. Which is it? Those men deserve a defense. And we must show the world that Boston is capable of giving them a fair trial. He believes every man in a free country deserves a fair trial. But ambition does play a part in this. There's no bigger case. That cocktail of principle and ambition wins out, and he signs on as their attorney. 
In Boston, anti-British sentiment is everywhere. The defendants, Captain Thomas Preston and eight troops, face hanging if found guilty. You may proceed, sir. To get to the truth behind the shooting, Adams must uncover who gave the order to shoot and whether it was justified. I am for the prisoners at the bar. Traitors! And for uncovering the truth of this tragedy. This tragedy was not brought on by these soldiers, but by the actions of a hostile and unruly mob. He develops a defense that is based on the fact that this was a mob that was created and a situation of escalating violence was building. The part I took in defense of Captain Preston and the soldiers was the most exhausting and fatiguing cause I ever tried for hazarding my popularity and for incurring suspicions and prejudices which will never be forgotten as long as the history of this period is read. Colonist Richard Palms is a key eyewitness whose testimony could turn the case for Adams. Of the 22 witnesses at the Boston Massacre trial, Palms' location, just feet from the gunfire, puts him in the best position to say whether the order to fire comes from Captain Preston. Mr. Palms. Sir. Describe for the court, if you will, how you came upon the scene in question. Someone said that there was a rumpus down on King Street. So, of course, I went down there to see Captain Preston ahead of seven or eight soldiers at the customs house with fixed bayonets. Get off King Street! Captain! Are your soldiers' weapons loaded? With powder and ball, sir. As soon as he spoke, I saw something resembling ice or snow hit Private Montgomery on his right. Private Montgomery stepped one foot back and then fired his gun. But I had my hand on Captain Preston's shoulder after the shot was fired, and then I heard the word fire. And from whose mouth did the word fire emanate? I, I heard the word fire, but who gave it? I know not. Fire! With his cousin mounting a strong defense, Sam Adams sees his efforts to provoke an uprising slipping through his fingers. John Adams, ace in the hole trial, which his cousin doesn't want him to use, is a deathbed confession from Patrick Carr. Doctor, good morning. When had you your last conversation with Patrick Carr? About four o'clock in the afternoon, preceding the night on which he died. And what was it he said? He said he fired. Yes, but why did the soldier fire? He fired. To defend himself. To defend himself. Oh. To defend himself. The defense rests, Your Honor. By today's standards, Dr. Jeffrey's testimony recounting a dying man's last words would be considered inadmissible, hearsay. But puritanical thinking gives John Adams an advantage. At the time, deathbed testimony is considered irrefutable since it is believed that no one would dare lie so close to facing God's final judgment. Hugh Montgomery, Matthew Kilroy, you are found guilty of manslaughter and for your crimes are hereby sentenced to be branded. Captain Thomas Preston, as for you and the rest of your men, you are all found not guilty. Far from
from ruining his career, his defense of the soldiers solidifies John Adams as the most gifted legal mind in Boston, perhaps all the colonies. But to put that brilliant mind to use, Sam Adams and his Sons of Liberty must first convince him to join them in open rebellion. Because when their struggle turns to war, they will need John Adams to persuade a people to defy their king and to define the ideals of freedom and liberty upon which America will be built. I believe we have certain rights, and I am not prepared to cede these rights to any man, no matter how noble his title. As hostilities escalate in Boston, the British Army answers with deadly force, and the only justice comes from a manslaughter conviction, punishable by branding and no jail time. The colonists are scared that the army can kill with impunity. The decision quiets the resistance for a time, but it's a fragile peace that hangs over the city. Have you seen this? My dear cousin still calls it the Boston Massacre, even after the acquittals. It will only take the slightest infringement to cause that spark to flare up again. And of course, it is the Tea Act, which demands that all the colonies purchase one kind of tea from one monopolistic vendor. And that then brings these passions that were latent back to the surface, and there will be no let up in them until it explodes in the river. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.